And at this time, I invite Tom Carmody Jr. to come forward to share a few words. It is water. <laughs> Shoot. Second Corinthians um, chapter one, verse three through four. Praise to the God of all comfort. This is one of those days where, as the oldest son and the namesake of our father, it's kind of like, <clears throat> as I told my brothers and sisters, you have an expectation of just the, the customary things that you have to do as a family. And when Christopher passed away, I knew the day was going to come. I didn't know if it was going to be me that was going to go first or daddy, but I felt like that... <clears throat> if it were me that would have to stand up here and say a few words that uh, every day I ask God for the, the gift to do it with grace and to do it such that I would not embarrass him. And I look out across this room filled with so many people who are more than friends to us, y'all are our family. and. Please know that I feel your arms around me right now. And if you'll bear with me, I think I can do this. I know I can do it. As daddy, you know I can do it. And so I will try my best. Um, one, of the, one of the wonderful things about being one of such a large group of children that um, our parents raised us to express ourselves. <clears throat> And, uh, and so what I asked my brothers and sisters to do was this. I'll do my part and I'll stand up here and I'll, re I'll recite the words that you would like for me to say to all of our friends and family. But let them be your words because if I try to tell you in my words about our best friend, I would wear y'all out and we'd be here as my Grand Art used to say, till the 32nd of the month. <laughs> and so I, I, I do want to thank my brothers and sisters for the, the real labor of love that they put in front of me to read to you today. And I'm going to do my best to repeat those verbatim if I can. If I go off a script, it's just because out of my heart of hearts, I have to say something. Uh, first of all, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and I want to thank you, all of our priests, all of our friends and family for your support and for being here today to celebrate the life of our dear father. Um, as you can imagine, within our family, as I said, we all wanted to share our thoughts and feelings about dad, um, but it was decided that I would be honored to speak for the entire group, but that each sibling would contribute his or her part to this talk. And each of us, just like I just told you myself, each of us could go on and on about daddy. And so we agreed that each of our siblings would be limited to a mere 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask you all to please, wherever you are, sit back <laughs> and get very comfortable because I have 12 contributors and I think Michael's calculated it down to about two hours that I'll need to be here. Um, thanks be to God, we are offering an intermission about halfway through this. There will be ice cream outside which is the way daddy would like to do it. So, But how do we encapsulate, I guess that was the question that we had 
just starting about this exercise. How do we encapsulate 80 years of an exemplary life in just this one single hour? God knows we could share stories about cars, boats, tuition, <laughs> juvenile traffic court, <laughs> more tuition, various emergency room visits, family road trips. But thanks be to God, my brothers and sisters decided to focus today on actually the pearls of wisdom that our Father instilled in us just every, every day. And um, I think that it, and I hope it gives you a glimpse, although every one of you know this already, of the true Southern gentleman and devout Catholic that so influenced and guided each of us. If some of these stories are not correct and you are sitting there, don't look at me and do this. <laughs> okay? Because I, as I said, I am going to read it as best I can. During Tom Carmody's first visit to Beaumont to meet what would be his future in-laws, as well as his future brothers and sisters-in-law, as you all know, my mother's one of 11 children. Um, Daddy had observed and, and made note of it at Paul Paul's funeral, it was my mayor's funeral, that the first time that he went to their home on Ashley, that uh, he said, I, I observed a plethora of baseball bats, baseballs, baseball bats, roller skates, scooters, cowboy boots, just lying in the driveway. And he said that he quietly noted to himself, I will never live like this. <laughs> and, and so one of the truisms was that Daddy always said, never say never. Not sure how many people are familiar with some of these expressions, but if you'll give me just a second to explain them to you, I think you'll understand. E T O B. Wish I had a nickel for every time I heard that expression. E T O B. Thomas, every tub on its own bottom. This is one of our father's favorite catchphrases, and the acronym actually is ETOB, every tub on its own bottom. This gem could sum up most of what daddy desired for us, each of us. This phrase could, could be heard referencing the need to pack one's own bag for a trip, regardless of whether or not you might've been a five-year-old. <laughs> and the repercussions of having to wear two left shoes or at a later, later stage in life as a gentle and firm reminder that we need to figure out how to pay for a speeding ticket on our own. <laughs> We've taken this saying to heart that our life's outcomes are determined by our own decisions, that we are to be responsible for ourselves and respectable to all others. Let the boat pull you up. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm not doing it justice because I'm going to try and reach down inside of me. You, you have to scream that over the motor on the back of the <laughs> on the back of the boat. Um, both mom and daddy always loved the water, and our father spent countless hours teaching each of us to water ski. And for those of you that have ever done it or have learned to water ski, the logistics of just teaching a single child is really challenging. But now envision that you have one child in the water. You have eight children behind you at the wheel of the boat and, and four more children on the bow of the boat. <laughs> but our father's words would always resonate over the engine. Lean back, tips up, bend your knees, and let the boat pull you up. 
Again, can't imagine how many times I've heard him say that. <clears throat> but those words helped to get us not only up on two skis, but also on slaloms, and that still resonates with each of us today. Let the boat pull you up and enjoy the ride. Daddy, forgive me, but I'm reading what they've asked me to read. <laughs> Suck egg meal. <laughs> for, for those of you in the back, I'm going to repeat myself. <laughs> Suck egg meal. <laughs> Whenever anything unexpected happened, and it, and it usually did with all of us, this was our father's expression of frustration. <laughs> and I would say truly the closest I ever heard him come to a profanity. For example, when the family ski boat, aptly named Sunshine, failed to start on the morning of July 4th after we just launched it into Cross Lake, <laughs> you would hear an exclamation from Daddy of suck egg mule. <laughs> this is the same phrase that was prompted as soon as the starter cord on his lawnmower would break off and he'd be holding the rope in his hand. <laughs> or especially if he hit a disappointing shot while we were playing badminton. <laughs> but perhaps our favorite time to hear Daddy say that, and for those of you who ever had the experience of playing cards against Thomas Carmody, excuse me, Tom Carmody, whenever someone else would dump the queen of spades <laughs> on our father during a heated game of hearts. Daddy would just look at the card and say, suck egg mule. <laughs> My mother made a notation that I have to go off script here very quickly. The finest compliment I think I've ever heard paid was, your father never embarrassed me. Um, and that brings me to the point of this. That expression was the closest I ever heard my father come to a profanity in front of his children, his grandchildren, and just about anybody else I ever heard my father deal with when it was a situation perturbed him. Up, back. <laughs> Up, back. And this one I'm going to go again off script. And I believe, as I recall, being one of the older children, that this was actually something that came by way of the feeling clan through my mother as they had so many children and whenever they would travel anywhere, it's, as you can well imagine, it's hard to fit a large number of little children into a car. But my mother and father, they were always happy to have our friends join us in whatever we were doing. And so my father would load up the Ford LTD station wagon with so many little children. And then, of course, this is the days before mandatory seatbelt laws, but I guarantee the Louisiana State Police would tell you that he'd overloaded that car. <laughs> Daddy would, or Mama would say, up, back. And all of us knew that in order to get more people in the car, that we'd have to squeeze into the seats and alternate either sitting up or sitting back. As we were sitting here this morning, you see all these Carmody's crammed into this little spot up here. And as I turned around, that's when I thought to myself, it's up back today, y'all. <laughs> um, but thanks be to God, when we were little, our hips were narrow. And he easily packed at least six children across that bench seat of that station wagon. And then he put several more who could ride in the, uh, the jump seats, the rear jump seats. And as sometimes happened, if there was strife along the way, Daddy, with a very measured tone, would just over his shoulder say, sit on your hands. 
And if that didn't work, he would follow it up with, it's a long walk home from here. <laughs> Do you want me to pull over? <laughs> hmm. We've collectively taken from this that there's actually room for everybody. And you're not to sweat and don't sweat the small stuff because sometimes you can't subscribe to the program. <laughs> Go ask your mother. <laughs> Daddy's love and respect and deference to our mother, and there's parentheses around this expression, perhaps an effective parenting technique, was a, whenever he was a, approached with a request from any one of us, his usual response was, go ask your mother. Uh, this, in hindsight, did provide him with some cover of deniability <laughs> if it were needed for any subsequent ramifications of said request. I never saw my father need any deniability on anything. But some examples of this will suffice. When you would walk up to, when any of us would walk up to my father and say, may I spend the night out? Go ask your mother. Or even a more difficult question, may I have someone come and spend the night? <laughs> and again, he would say, go ask your mother. We easily take this life lesson to be that it is okay to shirk your parenting responsibilities. However, we know that actually that we've chosen to believe that he deferred to our mother out of complete respect, trust in her judgment, and daddy was okay with whatever mama decided. <clears throat> All of you that are in this room that have ever been in 1090 East Kings Highway for anything will recognize this next expression. Get out of the kitchen. <laughs> the parent, our, our parents' home, uh, the kitchen was constantly abuzz with high volume traffic and a lot of loitering. And as long as you were serving a productive role in assisting with a meal preparation or table setting or cleaning, all was well. However, loiterers such as those staring into an open refrigerator leaning against the oven door or just sitting on the countertop were immediately escorted out by our father saying, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> Through that lesson, we all quickly learned that if you weren't adding value to the task at hand, you're supposed to provide space for those that are willing to get the job done. This one I'm going to try and make sure that I can convey because for those of you who've never played badminton, my father loved the game. And my father loved to win the game. <laughs> never smash backing up. <laughs> Again, let me explain what that means. The smash, of course, is one of the strokes in the badminton game, but it is used to basically effectively drive the bird down on the floor of your opponent's side of the net. Daddy was never more <laughs> irritated than he would, when, when, when a, he, he'd lose a winnable point in a competitive doubles badminton game after he had already explained to his partner the strategy for victory. Unfortunately, some of his partners, <laughs> as well as every one of my brothers and sisters, would need to be reminded of this sage advice after having lost the point. He would remark, never smash backing up which was often preceded by suck egg mule. <laughs> he, 
But the lesson is translated as this, and I think that in his own way, what Daddy was saying was, do not put yourself in a bad position and then compound your mistake by making another error. My name is not Hey Dad. <laughs> Ace, Daddy-O, number one, Daddy Dear, Chief, Coach, Champ, Big T. Those were all acceptable terms of endearment which our father embraced. However, he considered the salutation, hey dad, as unacceptable and quite frankly, disrespectful. So when these words were uttered, those, that phrase fell on deaf ears, except daddy would in turn address you with a stern yet unflappable clarification. My name is not Hey Dad. Can you imagine the number of phone calls interrupted <laughs> with children trying to get his attention and every one of them starting off, Hey Dad. Uh, this might seem trivial, but uh, it was his small and yet unwavering consistent response and in retrospect taught all of us an important life lesson of wait your turn and be respectful. I will give you a nickel if you can name this song. <laughs> Daddy loved to challenge all of us. One of his favorite games that provided hours of entertainment was to try to stymie all of us with identifications of songs from the big band era. And driving in the car, he would turn the radio up and he would announce, I will give you a nickel if you can name this song. And if it wasn't Glenn Miller, you didn't have a chance. <laughs> and that nickel, nickel safely stayed deposited in our father's pocket. It instilled a constant desire to try to best daddy, to just to get one right. Um, maybe, maybe a dollar was dispensed among all of us over all those years, one nickel at a time. Um, but it was the playful joy of the challenge that showed us that resiliency is important. Just because you wanna win, you have to do it fair and square. In 15 minutes, none of us will know the difference. As small children, we spent many happy hours at the Shreveport Yacht Club, and as a special treat at the day's end, Daddy would offer to get us a drink. And Daddy seemed very careful to make sure that he took all of our drink orders, which usually included an assortment of flavors, as you can imagine, uh, knee-high grape or red, orange crush or root beer, I'd like a lemonade. And then Daddy would go into the clubhouse there while the rest of us would swim. Or didn't. And he'd, he'd come out of the clubhouse and he'd have a single Coke <laughs> with several straws in it. <laughs> and as soon as he got back and upon hearing, hearing the complaints from each of us that we did not get exactly what we told him we had ordered, his response was, we each can have a sip. <laughs> and in 15 minutes, none of us will know the difference. His simple lesson there was that in life, you cannot always get what you want, but be thankful for what life offers you. Um, to be sure, Daddy's words spoke volumes to us, but his actions were almost larger than life. He humbly lived by what he believed in. He never asked any of us to emulate his actions he just quietly led by example. Um, 
There was no error about my father. My father was comfortable in badminton shoes, boots, or dress shoes. Um, I think that's why so many people were drawn to my father. Just as I mentioned to many of my friends, he was just so easy to love. And you would encounter my father in just the most offhand moments of the day, and he was so kind, and he made you feel like you were the one that was important. It really didn't matter to him. I don't care who you were, what your station of life was, your age, whether you were three or 93. Daddy made you feel and made us feel individually special and important. I'm sure others were drawn to this gentle nature and inspired by his quiet convictions and his loving acceptance of all. My father, our father, knew his priorities and his actions followed suit. His Catholic faith, our mother, their family, set a very high bar, as you can well imagine. And all of my brothers and sisters and all of my nieces and nephews are now on our tiptoes to try to make sure we can reach that bar. Lastly, Daddy, I know you're not here, and I know you're with our Heavenly Father, but it's W-O-T. <laughs> My father had the patience of Job. And it had to had. I mean, look at this. But one of the things that he would in inevitably say about any of us when we were all in one spot and supposed to be somewhere, it would be W-O-T. I am waiting on Thomas. It could be W-O-K, I am waiting on Catherine. It could be W-O-K, I'm waiting, W-O-C, I'm waiting on Caroline. It could be W-O-C, I'm waiting on Christopher. It could be W-O-M, I'm waiting on Michael. It could be W-O-J, I'm waiting on Josephine. W-O-A, I'm waiting on Anne. W-O-A, I'm waiting on Anthony. W-O-E, I'm waiting on Elizabeth. W-O-E, excuse me, W-O-J-B, I'm waiting on John. W-O-M, I'm waiting on Margaret. W-O-B, I'm waiting on Bridget. Or W-O-M, I'm waiting on Marie. Right now, Daddy, you're waiting on Thomas. <laughs> so, in closing, and, and with really heavy hearts, but this morning when I got up, I looked outside, and it is a beautiful day. The kind of day that my father would always just remark, what a beautiful day to fly. I mean, it is. There's not a cloud in the sky. And I thought, how appropriate it is that it is such a day. Um, throughout our lives, our Father always comforted us with this advice. Father touched on it. In any situation, don't panic. We're going to do what needs to be done to address the situation. We're going to leave it better than the way that we found it. And finally, we are all going to be all right. God bless you for being with us. I know that each of you feels as blessed as we do to just have known my father. Um, I dare say there are many people in this room that have lost their best friend today. But what a legacy. And in closing, I would just say, not thank you, Daddy, but thank you, God, for Tom Carmody. Well done good and faithful servant.